What's up, everyone? Welcome to Straight Shooting. AJ Riley is MIA, literally. So replacing him for today's show, Paul Roshan. I'm Matt Basson. Welcome to the show. Before we get going, got to remind you, like, subscribe, everywhere you can find us, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We got TikTok now, full episodes on YouTube. Paul, got a show full of NFL deals going on, MLB deals going on. We're going to start just a little south of us in Cleveland, where they were already <laughs> already in the news for the way they were treating their current quarterback in Baker Mayfield and how sour that has gone. And now they're even more in the news because of who they have decided to bring in in one Deshaun Watson. How you liking all this drama? I, honestly, I love it. Uh, one thing we've talked about for a long time is the NBA. You, you know I'm not the biggest fan of the NBA as a league as a whole, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've always said their off-the-court drama is more compelling than their on-the-court drama. And that's something the NFL doesn't really have a lot of, especially – when it comes to trading assets, there's not a lot of big trades in the NFL. The trade deadline usually comes and goes without a bang. You don't see 15 guys moved. Like it's just, there's just not a lot of player movement through trades in the NFL. It happens sometimes, but it, it, not nearly as much as the other leagues. It's not as exciting. So this offseason has brought a complete 180 to that, right? So I, I think I, I'm a little bit sad because I thought it was hilarious when Cleveland almost played themselves to having no quarterbacks, mm-hmm. it was it was incredible, right? So you, you have this very public pursuit of Deshaun Watson, uh, regardless of what you think of his personal issues, we're on the field only, right? But they have a very public pursuit of him. And then, well, Baker's like, all right, screw you guys. I'm, I'm not going to stick around and be a part of this. You guys clearly wanted to replace me. So why? why? I, I don't feel the love. I He did the Josh Gaddis, right? Like, I, I don't mm-hmm. feel loved by my organization, I'm going to peace out. Um, and I, I thought that was great because I honestly thought Deshaun was going to go to the Falcons or the Saints and Cleveland was going to be stuck with no quarterbacks. No quarterback. <laughs> but they got a quarterback. They got the deal done. Um, so it, it, a lot of drama, right? But if, well, if we talk about the drama, field, I mean, this guy still has 22 women claiming horrible things about him. And Cleveland comes out – with this, you know, blanket statement, we've done extensive in- investigations and legal and reference and all this stuff. But at the same time, they're not providing specifics about these investigations. The women have already come out and said that they were not spoken to by the Browns. Their their lawyer came out and said that they, they haven't talked to the Browns at all. So what investigating have they really done outside of just talking to Deshaun Watson and saying, Deshaun, did you do this? No? Okay, cool. Come on. Come be in Cleveland. Does, does watching game tape count as investigation? Yeah, the, oh, watching game yeah. tape in this particular situation, no. That's investigating for your next game maybe. But for signing on a guy who has a very good chance of being suspended and you even build into his contract the potential for that by saying they're only going to make his base salary a million dollars this upcoming season. So if he is suspended, he only loses around 60 k a game. I. It's not – Super uncommon practice for guys to have low base, but obviously in this situation, it's it's done with purpose. Uh, I, I said that because I, that's about the extent of the investigating they did, obviously, right? Like meeting with Deshaun and his lawyers does not count as investigation given the circumstances of what's going on. I, I hate, and I know it's the process, it's how things are done, but I hate that they come out with this canned statement that is not going to appease anybody. The, the people that only care about the on-field stuff and want a good quarterback, they don't care regardless. The people that want the team to do right and act like they care, they're not going to be appeased by this statement. So what is the what is the purpose of it? You're wasting everybody's time. I mean, just come out and say, listen, we discussed we with the show. Yeah, well, no, you, no, you can't do that. They, they, can't, they can't do that. But you can come out and be like, listen, we talked with Deshaun. Um, his personal issues are getting settled. We're ready to move on on the field. We thought he was a good fit for our organization. That's all you have to say. I mean, you don't – everybody knows. Truth of, we don't believe in our quarterback. We need who we think is a great quarterback because there are a lot of people out there who do believe that about Deshaun Watson. And we don't care about his troubles off the field if he can provide us wins on the field because he hasn't killed anybody. He hasn't assaulted anybody. This is according to him. 
<laughs> you've got 22 women claiming otherwise. We don't even kill anybody anyway, but you got 22 women claiming some form of assault, and you just seem to be okay with this. I just I think it's a miserable look for Cleveland. I I don't think. I mean, we've talked about this on our previous podcast quite a few times, right? Like at the end of the day, the NFL cannot be character judges or they wouldn't have a league. They have, they have to let players play. And that's what Cleveland's doing. Cleveland said, okay, the criminal matter's done. You know that Deshaun is eventually going to settle out of court with his new deal is kind of almost uh, new ammo for the civil cases that he's facing. Right. So he's going to end up settling out of probably out of court for a substantial sum of money that'll probably never be disclosed. And then we will completely move on from this. And then it will be about what happens on the field. And and you've seen this countless times in sports. This isn't the first time and it's not going to be the last time that an athlete's been accused of or did wrongdoing and moved on with his life, whether it was Ben Roethlisberger in the same division or numerous other cases that we've seen in the NFL and the NBA and really across sports. So now we're, we're, we're pretty much... We're almost to the close of this. It'll be a news blurb when he eventually settles. It will be a, another news cycle if the NBA deci- or sorry, if the NFL decides to take action. Because remember, the NFL has not punished him, and we have seen countless times the NFL doesn't need you to be criminally even charged necessarily, but definitely not criminally convicted for them to levy punishment. And last season, and I've seen this a lot out there, it's kind of a misconception. Last season, Deshaun did not sit out the season, and he was paid. He was not suspended by the NFL, and the Texans, the Texans just chose not to play him. He was on the active roster the entire season, collecting his checks as if he was playing every game. Nothing changed. He wasn't suspended by the league. No one said, you can't play. The Texans just didn't want to deal with it, because he didn't want to play for them anyway. Then he had the, the cases ongoing, so... They just said, you know what? Fine. Sit home. We'll pay you. It's not a big deal. Now he's going to play this upcoming season. And like you already alluded to, they have basically baked in a thing in case the NFL does come down heavy, which I I would expect four to eight games. I think that's what you can expect. Um, But who knows? I mean, trying to guess what the NFL is going to do when it comes to punishment is fool's folly. But now now those are going to be the two news stories. He's going to settle. That'll be a news blurb. He's going to get punished and take it. That'll be a new story. And then we're done. This case is behind us, and it's all about what he does in Cleveland on the football field. And for Cleveland, does he offer enough of an upgrade over Baker Mayfield to be worth the cost, both the acquisition cost and the contract that they gave him? Well, like you said, eventually this will all be behind us. We're going to find out. But I think this is why his guaranteed of over $80 million more than the next best contract is because they think about half of that is probably going to go to these women when he settles out of out of court. Uh, sticking in the Midwest, uh, moving up to Green Bay, Wisconsin, where the Packers get their man. They re-sign Aaron Rodgers to a ridiculous contract, three years, $150 million, and then follow that up, not by securing their best weapon for Aaron Rodgers, but by saying goodbye to their best weapon for Aaron Rodgers. Paul, make this make sense for me with the Green Bay Packers re-signing Rodgers and then trading away Devontae Adams. Well, I, I would say the sense is simple. I'd say they couldn't afford after the absurd contract they gave Rodgers, Devontae Adams, but that's not true because they were just going to backload everything and broom off whatever assets they had to broom off because the reports came out. Green Bay offered Devontae Adams more than the Raiders did, which is... The Raiders gave him well, – how much was it per? Was it 28 per? It was something uh, crazy. Monday Adam, full contract. It, it's You don't have to look. It's not a big deal. It was it was an astronomical number, way, way more than you should ever pay a receiver, ever. And it, it's probably not going to be that good yeah, for the Raiders. Five years, but... $140 million, including a 19.25 signing bonus and 65.67 guaranteed. $28 million Average, dollars a year. over 20 per year for a wide receiver. And I, so you know, you know how I feel about the overrated value of receivers, but look at it from, even if you think receivers are great and they're a really important component of a team, look at the team that he just came from the quarterback that he just came from the team around him, not making $28 million a year, not making anywhere near that. And how much did green Bay with win with him? 
And you're telling me while paying him $28 million, the Raiders are going to be able to put a better team around him than Green Bay did? I, I'm just saying, I don't see this working out. I am personally upset that he didn't take Green Bay's offer. Green Bay obviously put their back forward. They wanted to make Rodgers happy. And this is one where, and you haven't seen Rodgers come out and say much. There were reports that as this started coming to a head uh, toward the end before he was traded, he kind of knew the direction it was going and what was going on between Devontae and the team. This is one that Rodgers can't be upset with Green Bay because they tried. I mean, they said, you will give you 29, 30 million, whatever it was that they were going to give him. And he said, you know what? My heart's in with the, in Vegas with the Raiders and Derek Carr. So he can't be mad, but you look at now, they kind of dodged a bullet because they don't lose the goodwill with Rodgers because they tried their best, but they're not paying a receiver almost $30 million a year. They still have to deal with a crazy contract they gave Rodgers, like $50 million a year or whatever it was, but you don't have to pay Devontae Adams, and, and you kind of can have a roster. I mean, I, I was hoping. I was kind hoping of have a roster. So- kind of have a roster. You have Alan Lazard and who else to catch passes from Aaron Rodgers? Well, they're going to draft some guys. And they might make some smaller moves. Maybe they make a trade for a less heralded heralded guy. I mean, they, I'm sure they would have been in the market for a guy like DJ Chark, but he ended up going to the Lions and probably for more money than people expected him to get. But it's a one-year deal, so you always got a little bit of boost off that. Uh, they're they're going to be in the market. They're going to add some pass catchers. But at the end of the day, we've talked about it. it's not about pass catchers. You got to have a team. You really mm-hmm. do. I, it's it's you just do. Like it doesn't matter how good your receivers are. Look look at look at Arizona. Look at Arizona. They got AJ Green. Kirk, Christian Kirk was just made one of the highest paid receivers in the league. He had been replaced in the lineup by AJ Green who apparently had enough left. They have DeAndre Hopkins, right? What did that do for Arizona in crunch time? What? Well, nothing because their quarterback couldn't get the ball to him. Look at look hey, at Green Seattle. Stay healthy. Look at look at Seattle. You got you got Lockett, you got DK Metcalf, you got Russ Wilson, a very good quarterback. Where did it get them? Well, how many well, wins did they have last year? Six wins? I mean, bigger than Chris I, Cheese, so. th- that's why it's so important to build a team. Green Bay's got to keep the line. They got to keep the defense together. And yeah, they'll get some pass catchers. I guarantee you they're going to take at least one, if not two receivers in the first few rounds of the draft. But you can't pay Devonta Adams $30 million and expect to compete. Now it's all, even the contract with Rogers, it's going to come to a head. I mean, it's, they have a very short window here where they're going to try to win and they haven't done it yet. Look yep. at the last couple of years. The last two years, you could yep. very much argue they had the best team in football. You could very much argue they had the best team in football, and they didn't get it done. Their team, nope. unless because they, they play just- in a miserable place to live in January, and you can't win they- with that offense in that weather. In you should January. probably you should probably build a cold weather offense if you're yep. going to play at Lambeau. Or, I mean, or, what's know, the or point put of a home dome field? on top of your arena? Or put a dome on it, but I don't. I don't Retrofitting, though. If you're, if you're hell bent Rodgers. on keeping Aaron Rodgers in that passing offense, your 1A, 1B for your offense, you should probably put him in a spot where he can win no matter what the weather is. And Green Bay is just not that spot, not for passing. I See, and the problem I think and I suspect is I don't think Green Bay has a very good plan. I don't think they really know what they're doing. Rodgers – said he was going to leave. They panicked. They're like, we don't have a contingency plan. Jordan Love doesn't look like he's it yet. He hasn't shown enough. It, we just have to do whatever it takes to retain Aaron Rodgers. Without thinking, you know what? We haven't won lately with Aaron Rodgers. If we do this, are, do, are we really going to win in the next couple of years? And if we don't, then what? That's that's what I is a if I was a Packer fan that's what I would be concerned with. Um, I, obviously, you got to make a run. Rodgers is on his last legs in Green Bay, probably in the NFL in general. It, you have to you have to try, but they've got to start planning for the future and giving out these contracts. Kind of not it. Well, perfect timing, a perfect segment with that one because going from a team that hasn't learned to a team that looks like they're learning and planning for the future, Paul. We're going to play a little yes-no with you, and I want to get your thoughts on these. So the team that has looked like they learned their lesson are the Cincinnati Bengals. We all know that the biggest problem with the Bengals last year, the one they kept pointing out for the Super Bowl, for the AFC Championship, for every matchup they run in the playoffs, was their offensive line. 
They are now reportedly signing Cowboys right tackle Lael Collins. He becomes the third starting caliber offensive lineman added by the Bengals this week, joining guard Alex Kappa from the Bucks and center Ted Karras from the Pats. So my question to you, yes or no, are the have the Bengals already done enough with these three signings that they could expect to possibly be back where they were this year playing in the Super Bowl? Yes. I mean, that's why you signed them, right? You were just in the Super Bowl. It didn't work out in large part because of your offensive line that almost prevented you from getting to the Super Bowl. And you know that I think the offensive line is the most important unit in really sports, but football especially. It's so important. And they they didn't sit they didn't sit and be like, all right, maybe we'll try to get a guy in the draft. Maybe we'll see if we can get a low key guy or two here and there. They're like, we're going to, we're going to uh, completely address it in every possible way that we can and see if we can fix this thing. The problem is they were quite fortunate to get to the Super Bowl. They had a lot of things break their way. It is extremely hard to get back. Look, look at how many Super Bowl losers fall apart within a few years. Look, I mean, just go down the list from the Falcons. To, hell, look at the Eagles. The Eagles won the Super Bowl and fell apart. I mean, just it's so hard to maintain that level. People are you. You see the Pats, and the Pats maintain that level for. 15 years, almost 20 years. Like it's crazy. That's not the norm. It's very hard to maintain that level. So I think they've done everything they can to try to get back. And I applaud that. I haven't seen all the contracts, but if you're going to spend crazy money, the offensive line is a good place to do it. Uh, but it doesn't mean they're going to get back. They're doing the right things, but it's, it's hard in the AFC. Have you looked at the AFC lately? Oh, yeah. No, it's not. It's definitely not going to be easy. And then, you know, the teams that they upset along the way to get there are, you know, by most people's minds, the better teams. And that's why it was considered an upset. But I got to give to the Bengals trying, trying very hard not to be the, you know, 84 Dolphins who with <laughs> second year quarterback Dan Marino, who sets the world on fire offensively, gets to the Super Bowl, loses the Super Bowl and doesn't really sniff it again for the rest of Marino's career. So the Bengals are trying very hard to not emulate that with Joe Burrow. And then another obstacle is now if if Deshaun Watson is a difference maker in Cleveland, that's in division, right? Yeah. If Pittsburgh finds a quarterback, they're going to be a problem. What you mean? They, already got the quarterback. they got Mitch Trubisky. <laughs> Baltimore, they're not dead. They're still there. I, You know that I'm not as high on Lamar Jackson as a lot of people, but he still poses some problems. It's, it's not going to be a cakewalk for them. So get getting through the division to get – hopefully decent playoff seating. And then once you get into the playoffs, you still got to go through the gauntlet. You got to go through the three AFC West teams that are probably going to be in the playoffs. It's it's not going to be easy. Well, we're going to stick in the AFC. Another yes, no for you. Uh, big name receiver ended up being on the move. Juju Smith-Schuster going to the Kansas City Chiefs. Is this the perfect place for him to revive his career? Because his career has kind of become more of a joke as far as him being on TikTok, the memes and everything, and less so about his performance on the field. I, I think this is a brilliant fit for both parties. I, I didn't see the money, so team-wise, I'm not sure how that's going to affect the cap. But Juju, a few years one, ago... One-year contract for 10.75. So basically the same deal we gave DJ Chark, the Lions, we as being the Lions. Um, similar deal. A few years ago, Juju Smith-Schuster Juju Smith was considered one of the upcoming stars. Not like good receivers, but stars. He was dancing all over the field because he was catching passes and running all over the field. And listen, that offense was loaded and they were firing on all cylinders. And it's been a struggle bus. For a, a while now. And and, AB left, really. And you you have a young player that had a lot of early success and then a team dynamic that only got worse every year that he was there. And he had to handle success. He had to handle the attention both off the field and, of course, on the field from opposing defenses. He had to learn how to be a professional. He didn't forget how to play. You look at how, how has their quarterback situation been the last couple of years. It, it Not good. Not good. You Then you're competing for – catches with two other very good receivers. It, it's 
he is a, he did not forget how to play receiver. He is still a pretty darn decent NFL receiver. And to go to Kansas City to an offense that is going to make it pretty easy to a quarterback that can find you and get you the ball consistently, accurately in stride, to with a head coach that has the acumen to put you in position to succeed. I, I it can't you can't have a better place and it's it's a one year rental right they they need to replace a pass catcher they bring him in look what they did with Sammy Watkins the the disappointment that Sammy Watkins was his whole career right mm-hmm. and then he comes to the Chiefs and he kind of is relevant like he didn't put up superstar numbers but they used him I think Juju can be better than Sammy Watkins was for the Chiefs I think he's a better receiver but regardless if you're if you're Juju Smith Schuster. Where else would you rather go to try to rehabilitate for a year and then get a better contract? Yeah, I'd, I'd much. I would love to have Kelsey on one side and Cheetah on the other, where I know they they can't double me. If they double me, they're leaving one of these two guys on single coverage. Are they out of their minds? So I agree with you. I think it's the perfect place for him to go, where he can kind of remind everyone why he was one of those ascending wide receivers. You know, with AB on the other side, and those were the guys they were, they were really focused on doubling him. Juju ate that defense's lunch, whoever that defense was. With Kansas City, you got Travis Kelsey and you've got Cheetah. They can't double everybody. So he's going to have chances to really eat that lunch and, you know, probably eat himself into a better contract next year. <laughs> All right. Sticking in the AFC, your favorite person to besmirch over the last few <laughs> months, Von Miller, has signed a six year. <laughs> $120 million deal with the Buffalo Bills. So my first question is, will he play all six years in Buffalo? No. <laughs> but <laughs> Buffalo's going to pay him to go away at some point. Um, listen, I don't I don't besmirch this man. I love Von Miller. Uh, but he's not the player that he used to be on an every down basis. Von Miller used to be an every down terror in all facets of the game. It didn't matter, run, pass. I mean, he was known for his pass rush extraordinaire, but it's not like he was a slouch in the run game. and He could affect the game down to down. He's not the same player anymore. I think he's 32, somewhere around there. He's around 32 years old. And he he's had some injuries. He's dealt with some issues. The Broncos really fell off. It was a, a good trade for the Rams when they acquired him because they needed another guy that could get to the passer, and he was cheap. He didn't cost the Rams a lot to acquire. It's He's not cheap for the Bills. This is, honest to God, one of the craziest contracts, and I feel like we, we see something every year like this, but this, this really takes the cake with his age and his declining production on a down-to-down basis. And I know people will look at the sack total. So they see that he had a sack or two in this playoff game or a sack in the Super Bowl or a huge sack near the end of the game on third down, which for a couple weeks in a row, he did that seemingly at the end of every game. And they'll be like, what are you talking about? This guy's still good. The problem is, yeah, he can still make the splash play every once in a while, but you're paying a guy $20 million a year to play defensive end, to play outside linebacker. You have got to be able to be a factor in someone that the offense schemes for, play in and play out. You cannot make a big play here and there. It's not enough to justify that contract. It's just not. You need every down players. It is not that he doesn't try. I'm not saying he takes plays off. He just isn't the player that he was in his prime, which it happens to everybody. He's still a a good NFL player. He's still a good role player. They're giving him $20 million. Did you what you saw with the Rams last year, would you have given him even 12 million dollars a year it's hard to, it's hard to put a, exactly a, a number i'd put on it because he's playing with aaron donald and he did make differences at times um but this is a guy coming you know coming in as one of the better defensive careers we've seen my question on that is does it matter where he's going with buffalo being last year ranked i believe the number one defense is it is it less on Von Miller to have to do as much because they already have a pretty good defense that he's joining? I, you certainly hope so. I mean, that's that's their goal, but part of their problem, especially in crunch time, was getting to the passer. You saw that in the playoffs. You saw that when they lost to the Chiefs in overtime. At the end of that game, when they gave up how many touchdowns in what felt like 45 seconds of play to the Chiefs, and, and then obviously in the first possession of overtime, they brought him in to address those problems. The thing is, when you're paying him that much money, he kind of has to do more than just feed off other people because Mm -hmm. eventually he's going to cost you other players. Okay, last one of yes, no. 
the Raiders making all sorts of headlines. We saw Devontae Adams come in. We're now seeing Stephon Gilmore has also joined them on the defensive side of the football. With all of these pieces coming in and a very stacked now AFC West, can the Raiders make the playoffs next year? She said, can they? I'll say yes. Percentage. Uh, <laughs> let's, give a, let's give a percentage that you think. they're. So the Chiefs are, you think the Chiefs are 100% to make the playoffs next year, right? So the, the Chiefs are going to make the playoffs. You have an extra spot now. You got okay. Broncos. You got Chargers. You, you got three wild cards. Raiders. So who? So I, I, I think the Broncos on paper are that second team from the yeah. AFC West. Now we saw last year, the NFC West was the craziest division of football. They were super stacked and they got three teams in the playoffs. It looks like the AFC West is going to play that role this season, right? So I I look at the Broncos on paper and I think that they're that team that could contend for the division and, and obviously they hope more, but we have not seen Russ with competence around him in a while. I, I'm not 100% sure what he's going to look like. We all know what we think Russ can be, but he's got to go out there and show it. He's got to gel. And the Broncos also gave up a lot to get Russ. Not I'm not just talking money and picks. I'm talking about players, right? Like you lost Noah Fant. You lost Shelby. You, you have some holes now that you have to fill. So he's not stepping in to the, what the Broncos were last year, but they're still pretty darn good. And, and they felt like they're a quarterback away since Peyton's been gone pretty much. And they haven't got it. Now you have your guys. So on paper, you got to put them number two. But maybe they could finish third. Any division in this, any order in this division would not be surprising. And I don't think many people disagree with that. I one through four, you could order them however you want. I would put the Raiders probably third in the pecking order. I like Derek Carr more than most. I think the Raiders are building a pretty decent team. Um, the AFC West has gone crazy, but look at the Chargers and all the moves that they've made. Most people would probably have the Chargers above the Raiders. Um, a lot of hype about Justin Herbert. He's a very good young quarterback. I like what he's doing a lot. Uh, I don't like the contract they gave Mike Williams. We talked about receivers, $20 million for Mike Williams. I mean, if you gave me the choice to, if you gave me the choice between $20 million to Mike Williams, $20 million to Von Miller, or, and you don't give me the option to just kill myself, uh, I'm probably probably paying Von Miller, even in his advanced age. Like it's, But it's, man, those are just rough contracts. So you look at, are they doing enough? How is Derwin James going to look like with another healthy season if he can stay healthy? Are the Chargers going to stay healthy? And I, they added J.P. Jackson to that secondary. They, which in, in that is the signing that not as many people are talking about, but I think is like uber important. I look at the Chargers and I really like what they're doing on the secondary and they have the edge rushers that everybody knows, right? Like they have the, they have the, that's the famous part of their defense, but on the back end, the guys that are really going to have to hold up when it comes in crunch time, JC Jackson is a huge addition to that. That defense was rough last year. Like that defense let them down a lot and it had spurts. It had spurts that played really well. It had spurts that played horrible. But when it came down to it, that defense let them down a ton. It's going to be a bloodbath. I mean, there's, there's, if I was the Raiders, I would have waited, honestly. I don't think the Chiefs have a long contention window. Like money's going to start killing them. They're already hemorrhaging players. They're lucky Frank Clark took a big pay cut to stay there cap wise. But, they're not gonna. They're not gonna compete forever. You don't know what Denver's gonna look like, but you assume Denver's making a run within the next couple of years, and that's probably it until they have to kind of pseudo rebuild. The Raiders could have just sat back and waited, slowly built their team. But we have an arms race. We have a nuclear war going on in the AFC West, and it's exciting. It's fun to watch. It absolutely is. Thirty percent. Thirty percent. They make the playoffs. Thirty percent. All right, we got an answer. <laughs> All right, well, we'll be keeping an eye on the AFC West and the rest of the NFL throughout the rest of the free agency period before the season gets back underway. Uh, Many, many months from now, the season that is coming up to get underway, Major League Baseball. And the big splash news that hit out of nowhere is that the team that just won the World Series in the Atlanta Braves and their longtime star, Freddie Freeman, have apparently had a not-so-great relationship the last so many months. And so just like they did when Mookie Betts became surprisingly available two years ago from Boston, the Dodgers swoop in and sign the Orange County native to a six-year, $162 million deal. Now, if you're not caught up on all the controversy that's going on, it's it's a big thing of he said, she said between what 
Freddie Freeman says how often he talked to the Braves in this offseason during the lockout and what the Braves say they did as well. There's been a whole bunch of controversy on this. The Braves were offering a five-year deal for plenty of money. Freeman was sticking hard. He wanted a sixth year. The Braves would not budge. And then out of nowhere, a, a literal like 12-hour ultimatum made by Freddie Freeman's agents to the Atlanta Braves. The Braves said no. And Freeman's in la-la land now. Are you Team Freeman or are you Team Braves in this fiasco? So you, the sticking point was that one year, right? Right. The Braves would not offer a six year. They offer, they would offer more money and a five year deal, but they didn't want to pay Freddie Freeman, who just turned thirty two. They didn't want to pay him until he was thirty eight. And that's, I don't blame them. How many times have we seen these mega contracts hurt teams? I mean, look at right in Detroit, right in the, around the corner with the Tigers with Miguel Cabrera far and away the best hitter in the game at the time that he signed that deal. And, how, and we, we knew at the time that it was going to be an issue. We knew that he was not on the back end of that contract. He was not going to fulfill the money that he was making. The Braves won the World Series. I don't want to say against all odds last season, but they were not the favorite to win the World Series last year. It was a surprise that they ended up winning the World Series last year. And obviously you would like to keep – your homegrown stars and the people that got you there, right? That, that's mm-hmm. you, you want to hold on to your core. You want to keep making a run at it, defend the title. But realistically, the Braves are probably not a team that are going to be there every year. They're not. They're a team that has to build and has to be smart, and they have to be smart with their money. Baseball contracts are fully guaranteed. The only way you're getting off the hook for that money and not paying it is if you traded him to another team and they agree to take X amount of it, right? If at 36, 37 years old, Freeman has fallen off a cliff and he's hindering you from signing people that you need to contend or re-sign players that you have, who's taking him off your hands? You're just kind of stuck with it. And yeah, you won a World Series. Yeah, you get the extra money and notoriety that comes with that. But at the end of the day, you have to make smart financial decisions and saying, listen, we'll, we'll give you, we'll give you money. We, we just, we're at five years. I mean, Freeman wants the sixth year because he's not dumb. Freeman knows that he's going to play for five years and then who's going to sign him to a big money contract. So I, I get why he wants it. I'm not, I'm not, not on his side because go get your bag, right? Like I don't fault anybody that goes and makes their money, but from a team perspective, I certainly am on the brave side of you have to have smart fiscal management. And I don't want to hear that there's not a cap because that's it's obtuse and that's not how things work. We don't just spend unlimited money. We don't have $400 million payrolls in MLB. It's There is a limit to spending regardless of whether it's a hard cap or not. Okay, well, part of the, put, of the tipping point for this was when the Braves, out of nowhere, signed Matt Olson to a giant deal. Matt Olson and Freddie Freeman play the same position of first base. Matt Olson is 27 years old instead of 32 years old, so they feel they are going to get the production for the entirety of that, I believe, eight-year contract they gave Matt Olson to come to Atlanta. And Freddie Freeman is using that as the, well, then they signed Matt Olson out of nowhere. No one even spoke to me. And he's really putting a lot on woe is me The Braves didn't do right by me. I only talked to them twice, you know, once before the lockout, once after the lockout, and it was more of a check-in thing. Did the Braves feel like they had a leg up on everyone else to re-sign Freddie Freeman, who's been with the organization his entire career, had become the face after Chipper Jones kind of, you know, handed it off to him, you know, you take the reins now because I'm done, and didn't really need to put as much of an effort in, at least they thought, into re-signing him because they already thought they had him in the bag. They just needed to negotiate a little bit with him. I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, like you said, they they said we will give you the money. We're just we're stuck on five years. We're we're not going to give a thirty two year old player six years. It's not going to happen. Olson is five years younger. Five years. That's that's quite a bit. Uh, they gave him eight years. That takes him to thirty five. That's still a little long. But thirty five and thirty eight in at, in performance. That's a world apart, isn't it? I mean, that's we're talking 
those years you you can fall off fast. And it's listen, some players, it's rare, but some players do play well into their late 30s. But you cannot bank on that as an organization. That's if he's 35 and still playing well, then you might resign him for a year or maybe two years, but not like a crazy deal. You can't tie up. How much did Freeman get? Like 30, 30 million a year ish? 30 he got a six year, 162 million dollar deal. It's a little less than they're probably 28, something like that, somewhere around there. I don't math. But I mean, this uh, is a guy who he's missed five games in the last five years. He's at an OPS plus of over 130 since 2012. He's a five-time all-star. He's a three-time silver slugger. He, the man produces. Like there's no question about it. And he's durable. He's missed five games in four years. That's unheard of in baseball. Well, it's not like they broomed him. They wanted to keep him, right? They they said they would pay him. It's the years. I mean, listen, you know how much I love Miggy. I Miggy's been my tiger for a really long time. But in hindsight, like that's not the contract that you wanted to make, even though yeah. you wanted to take care of your star and make him happy. And that hurt us. It's hurt us for a while. And it has it's slowed things down. It, it helped us tank a little bit early and it has slowed down the rebuild a little bit. That's a lot of money tied up. And you can argue that because of that maybe ownership is hesitant to dole out big money contracts, right? I mean, it's been a big deal to talk about Correa lately, that maybe that's not, should we spend the money? Should we not spend the money? Well, when you look at contracts like that and ownership says, look, we spent all this money and look how much of it was wasted or didn't pan out, you can see why they would be trepidatious to just print money, especially for 36, 37, 38-year-old players. I, by no accounts... Did Atlanta say, we want to move on from this guy and we're just going to get younger? It was, listen, we love you. We love everything you've done for us. You've been here from the beginning. We we grew up with each other and we want to have you for the rest of your career pretty much, but we cannot throw crazy money till you're 38. Like this is, this is our cutoff. We're going to do five years. And if he was not amenable to it, how many times do you go to the well? How many times do you call his agent, do you call him and say and repeat the same thing and say, we're still at five years. Are you taking it or not? So at some point, you have to move on. And if you have t- you have your guy, your target, Olsen's 27 years old, you, gotta, you can get a deal done with him. If you wait on Freeman to make a decision and he spurns you and then you lose out on your replacement, now where are you? So I, they, they did what they had to do, and I don't blame them. So there was in that last minute, do this or else situation, the two offers that came back from Freeman's people was sticking with that six year deal of 175 million or a little more than 29 a year, or we'll do 5 million if you give us over 33 million per season and $165 million for five years. So the Braves obviously chose to. (laughs) <laughs> chose not to go with that, and now we get to watch Freddie Freeman join a ridiculous lineup of Mookie Betts, Trey Turner, Justin Turner, Cody Bellinger, Will Smith. It's just going to be an embarrassment of riches again for the Dodgers for at least the next couple of years. Speaking of the shortstop that you did not want to pay. To Hold come. on. Context. Context, Context. matters. So we can't, yeah. You we did can't not want to pay him. the contract that we are about to talk about with oh, the Minnesota That's Twins true. That's fair. Of a three-year $105 million deal. Now, this is a this is a Carlos Correa. He is 20, he's entering his age 27 season. This man is in his prime, coming into his prime for the next few years. Figured it was going to be one of those six to eight year deals that he was looking for to set him up. Instead, he goes for a three year ridiculous deal where he's going to get 105 million and also has an opt out clause for years two and three. So after the first year, if this man plays amazing. He can go back to the free agent market and try and get that seven-year, eight-year deal for even more money. So how smart is Carlos Correa and how dumb are the Minnesota Twins? I equal on both sides of dumb and smart because I, it's a great deal for Correa. And you look at – so a lot of people feel like this is a depressed free agency market as far as money, both the way that owners are throwing away money, the way that the lockout may have affected things. You know that the players have been complaining forever that there's a conspiracy. We're just not going to pay players as much anymore, which is crazy. I mean, listen, you see the – you can – I hate mentioning this all the time, but it really is – one of the most recent case in points, you look at contracts like the Miggy contract, the Pujols contract, 
teams see that these don't pan out, and so they don't want to give them anymore. You cannot fault them for that, but the players are like, oh, it's a conspiracy. We don't want to give players $40 million a year anymore. Correa said, listen, I'm going to come. I'm going to make my money. I'm going to play great because I'm awesome and I'm young. And I got my own decision every year if I want. Whenever I feel like if I have a down year, all right, I'll just opt into my $35 million. No big deal. And then if I blow it up again, now I'm opting out. And it, it, it the Twins have – the it's non-existent leverage, but the Twins are just in a bad position because I don't think the Twins are Carlos Correa away from winning a title. So it's not the kind of let's pay $35 million to rent this guy and try to win a quick title. If he balls out, which is what you want, obviously, as a as a twin, the twins, you want him to play really well. And if the market gets hotter next year, he's going to opt out and get 40 plus a year on a long-term deal, right? So you just had him for a year to not win a title, but you got to sell some jerseys. That's cool, I guess. If he has a bad year, now you're basically overpaying him, right? Because And you don't want him to have a bad year. He has all the power, and really the Twins are just at the behest of hoping they can win in this short window and that he performs well enough to help them win, but not well enough to opt out and get a bigger contract. It, it doesn't make sense to me. My only thought for the Twins is you desperately wanted this guy. This was the only way he was coming to Minnesota because who had him going to Minnesota, right? So obviously you had to do something unique and in very much favor of him to get him to come to Minnesota. So and maybe they think that once he's there and they start building something and win some games, maybe they think that they can convince him like this is a good long-term place. I I don't like the contract. Like I, if I, if the Tigers had signed that, I would have been disappointed. The money is too much for me, to be honest. The thirty-five mm-hmm. part, we didn't even talk about the money. I think that's too much. Now I'm I'm always money's too much guy, but because I'm all about getting not necessarily a bargain, but you got to be efficient. You only have so many resources. But thirty-five, I honest to God, at the start of free agency, I thought he was going to get like a six to eight year deal for like twenty-eight per. That's where I thought he was going to end up. All right, and then the numbers started creeping up. He was looking for what, ten years, three hundred million, or something like that, mm-hmm. like something crazy. But even then, it's thirty per, right? But it's a longer it's deal. That Mookie deal. One, it's one of those bloated long contracts, and he'll be old and washed by the end of it. But no, he's getting thirty-five per, and not only thirty-five per. It's not like it's okay. It's thirty-five per, but it's only a couple years. It's not a team-friendly deal because he can just rip up the deal at any time. So the money doesn't make sense. The terms don't make sense. None of it makes sense. From a team standpoint, in my opinion, for Correa, home run contract. Yeah, no, absolutely. Speaking of hitting a home run, as we come to a close on our show here, we are not going to get out of here without letting you talk about your Michigan Wolverine. Last night, we are recording on Sunday with eight and a half minutes left to an eight point victory to advance to their fifth straight Sweet 16. By the way, our Michigan State Spartans lost to Duke. Couldn't handle the last three minutes of that game while being up. Duke made great plays. Some questionable calls. Not going to get into that. Ryan and I will get into that a heck of a lot more. I'm throwing stones this week. But, Paul, celebrate your Michigan Wolverines going from not even being in the tournament. Shouldn't have been in the tournament, everyone said, to now go to the top. They they were not close to not being in the tournament. But we talked about this before. And this is, honestly, it's it's, the biggest thing to me is – we lost to Indiana, and everybody's like, oh, my God, you lost to Indiana. Like in the Big Ten tournament, you were one and mm-hmm. done in the Big Ten tournament. And I'm like, it's not a big deal because we're going to get a cozy 11 seed. And I said, you you can check the scripts. I said, I oh, know, I oh, no. I was there. I seen it. We'll hopefully get a mid-major six seed that lacks size to handle us down low. Colorado give State, us, check. Give us a winnable round one matchup, and then who knows what happens from there. Then you only have to face a three seed. You're not facing the two or the one. After, like if you're if you're the seven or ten seed, right? Like Michigan State is, you have yep. to play the other one, and then you play the two seed. That's a generally is a tougher path. Now, depending on how seeding works out, a lot of people think Tennessee. Most people probably think Tennessee was playing better than Duke, but they were one of the hotter hotter teams in the country at this point. Seed wise, that's a tougher path. If you're an eight nine. Okay, you got a comparable game one, then you got to play a one seed after that. So right. why do I want to be a seven, eight, nine, ten seed? That's that's like a harder path to the Sweet Sixteen because I'm not in it to just win one game. Listen, you you open this up with Michigan is in their fifth straight Sweet Sixteen, which is unheard of. It's a the fifth team ever 
ever, fifth team ever to do it. The only Big Ten team ever to go to five straight Sweet yep. 16. Michigan State's you know, done four twice. Ohio State's done four. No one's done five. And it's us and Gonzaga right now with the active streaks to the Sweet yep. 16. This is exactly not, about seven. <laughs> it, it's, it's very special, but at the same time, Listen, Michigan hasn't been playing to win a first-round game in a long time. We're not a mid-major that's just happy to be here and wants to win a game and say we did something. We want to at least the goal, the, like the kind of low bar every season, is to get to the Sweet 16. Now, this season, it feels more special because of, obviously, all of the ups and downs of the season and just the fact that we didn't look good for quite a large part of the season. It, it took a long the whole season. You win, you lost. You win, you lost. You win, you lost. You won, you lost. You, you hadn't won two straight games in four months. In forever. Well, yeah, in a long time. But it, we were playing very good competition, which is why we had the like eighth ranked strength, strength of schedule in the whole country, which obviously helped us a lot when it came to seeding. And people are like, how does a 17 and 14 team get an 11 seed and avoid the avoid the play-in, but it's because your strength of schedule. It's because your the strength of your quad one and quad two resume. Those things matter. The metrics love Michigan. The metrics all had Michigan in the 30s despite all of those losses. So it's – and this is a team vastly improved from the beginning of the season. And that's really all you can ask of a coaching staff once the season starts. There were high hopes for Michigan at the beginning of the season. I think they were ranked fourth in the entire country. This was a team that on paper looked like they could be really talented, but you didn't know what they were going to look like because they lost so much last year. They lost several NBA players last year. They lost five, five like actual players that played mm-hmm. a good role on the team. You, you Obviously, you lost Franz Wagner, right? You lost your point guard, Mike Smith. You lost John D. Brown, everyone's favorite favorite energizer bunny off the bench. You lost guys like Austin Davis, who put in a ton of good minutes backing up Hunter for this team, was an important player. You All of these guys that you lost, where are you replacing them? Who are you replacing them with? So you got to transfer. Devontae Jones, the point guard, you don't know how that's going to work out. You, you lucked out last year with a point guard transfer, but you don't know how that's going to work out. You don't know how your freshmen are going to be. Michigan had a really good freshman class coming in, and that's what people think, okay, they're going to be really good. You don't know how freshmen are going to play until they're here. In the beginning of the season, it was rough. and We were 500 most of the way through the season, and the team just got better every week. After the Illinois COVID game where we played with seven guys, the, the literal minimum that you could play with that we fought hard and ended up falling apart late, we played like top 25 basketball through the end of the season. And yeah, we alternated wins and losses, but we had some good wins, right? We beat Purdue. We beat Michigan State. We beat Ohio State on the road without our best player, Hunter Dickinson. This team's peaking at the right time, doing what Michigan does. And it's it's exciting to be here when after the season we had, nobody thought we would be here. No one thought we were going to beat Tennessee. No, nobody thought we were going to beat Tennessee. And I, listen, I'm happy for Jawan. You can... Regardless of how everything went down and who was at fault, the fact that we did go through that, it was adversity. And then to come back and be here and the coaching adjustments that we've seen in these first two games, it's it's very exciting. And, you know, it sucks that MSU couldn't be here with us. They played a, they played a good game against you. They did. You guys you guys yeah. deserve to win that game. And you guys were right in, in it till the end. There's no shame in that. Honest to God, the whole state of Michigan is propping up the Big Ten right now because I don't know what the hell – everybody else is doing. I, I know that Illinois is just an embarrassment every single year. Iowa, trendy final four pick, I would know, couldn't get it done in round one against the 12 seed. Unbelievable. But listen, state of Michigan, we, we got the tourney on lock. We're, we're showing up. <laughs> well, we'll be enjoying watching your Wolverines next week. They might be the only ones representing the Big Ten at this point. Still got to see what happens with Purdue. But Michigan Wolverines, fifth straight Sweet 16. Congratulations, Paul. That's doing it for tonight. Got to remind you one more time, like, subscribe, wherever you can find us, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, full episodes on YouTube. Paul Roshan filling in for AJ Matt Bassin. We're, we're straight shooting.